we'll be blessed with preaching with the Colossians, but we've gone through the whole book. We've got started in January. So we've looked at Colossians, we've been going through it, we've come to the end. And if you turn with me to Colossians chapter 7,
And the people were astonished with the music that was being performed out of that violin that he thought that the auctioneer apparently, the people apparently thought was worthless. After the gentleman played, he put down the violin. He says with a new vigor in his heart, what am I to get with this violin? That violin is sold for three dollars. And she coined uh, this poem. People cheered. Some of them cried. We do not quite understand. What changed, what changed its worth, the man replied. The touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and torn with sin. Is auction cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game that he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and he's almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never quite, can quite understand. Worth of a soul, and a change of his walk, of a touch of the master's hand. Look at Colossians was written to a people that had been touched by that master's hand. The book of Colossians was relevant for them because they needed the encouragement to stand against the heresy that was coming at them. We had said before that the heresy was, in a word, Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a big word, and it just means that everything that is physical is evil, and everything that is um, not seen is good. And so what they would do is say Jesus could not be God, Jesus could not be good because he was physically. And Paul was writing to them that says the physical nature of Jesus was absolutely, positively important for their salvation. That Jesus' death on the cross actually took place. That his death on the cross was actually an atonement for sinners like you and me. Everyone needs to hear the word of God. And Paul was encouraging them to realize that they didn't need any other book. They didn't need any other Savior. They didn't need anything else. That Jesus Christ plus nothing equals what? Everything. But that's not how everybody lives, is it? We have Jesus Christ plus some things. I have to admit that's true of me. When we get down to it, we, we say we believe the Bible. We believe that it is inerrant. We believe that it is totally true. And it is trustworthy. But then we live like, well, it's, it's good, but it's not complete. It's not enough. And Paul was trying to let the people know that Yes, the Word of God, the revelation of Christ is enough for you. That when Peter writes that it pertains to everything necessary for life and godliness, that that's what you need. That's what you need. The Bible is not an old book, but it is a fresh and updated book. It was written to a people way back then, but it is also written to a people right now. See, how they learn to live with each other. How are these people at Colossae learning to live with each other with all the struggles that were going on in their lives? You know, everybody here has a struggle, right? Every week you have a struggle. Every, and some are greater than others. I, I admit that. Some have easier lives than others. Some go through different struggles than others. And, and we don't know always why that happens. But God knows. God has ordained them. He, he, they have passed through his hands. And they are meant for our good. And so, in our lives, we have to work and live with people. And Paul is closing with people. He's closing, like what we do normally in our letters, what we do is we always say, dear so-and-so, right? We have a reading at the beginning. 
Well, no, normally, Paul would sign his letters and greet people at the end of his letters, too. He was concerned about people. Because people were the ministry that he was involved with. And so this morning, we want to deal with how do we live together? Paul's saying, listen, these people have been benefit to you. They have lived together. They have been faithful. They have been encouragers. And they have fulfilled their ministry that God has given them. Well, how do we do that together? How do we as a church fulfill the ministry that God has called us and given it to us? <coughs> see, spiritual fullness, see, extends everywhere. See, the, the, the book of Colossians, if you get anything, Jesus most nothing equals everything. Or you could say, the book of Colossians is about the supremacy and the fullness of Christ. You could go back to chapter 1, which we looked at. Chapter 1 dealt with the supremacy of Christ in spiritual growth. The supremacy of Christ in the church. The supremacy of Christ in creation. There is nothing greater that I can offer you today than the person of Christ. There is nothing better than the person of Christ. Chapter 2. We find out that Jesus is not only that, but he's preeminent. He is supreme in the church. He's supreme in ministry. And he's supreme and better than all religions combined. All the religions start with man. Man's attempt to reach God. Christianity is all about the story of God's reaching men. And it makes a complete difference where we start, where we are. In the church, together, it's a place where we grow, where we do ministry. And now Paul, and we said in chapter 3, he dealt with the relationships we have, and home, family, the church, and every place. He dealt, dealt with the working situations and now he's dealing with prayer and goes outside the church. And now he's coming back and says, listen, the home of ministry, evangelism, disciple making, everything you know is within a body of believers that have come together to be there for one another. I call that holy harmony. Holy harmony. There's a harmony in the church that the world should look at us and say, Why? I want that. You know, you put, you put a bunch of people in a room, you put two people in a room, there's got to be an argument, right? Put three people in a room, you probably have a political committee. You put four people in a room, and you have a boxing match. I, I don't know, it goes on and on. Because, because everybody has these ideas, and ideas are good. Ideas need to be us. But we have to live in holy harmony. And the Bible talks about a, a philosophy of ministry. How we do, how we're going to get from where we are to where we're going to go. And there are four P's up, or three P's today. I'm not going to talk about the fourth P. Well, I may talk about the fourth P. We'll see. Three P's, Paul says, that are necessary for a church to grow for people to grow in the likeness of Christ. First of all, he deals with people. People partnerships. That's number one. Paul's concerned about people and partnerships. Or I would call it people partnerships. Now, you have to understand all our words are going to start with keys in them, okay? So people partnerships. Then, in these verses, he talks about the Powerful prayer. Powerful, powerful prayer. And then finally, he talks about persuading population. Persuading population. So really you have people, prayer, and proclamation are the ingredients that a church has to have to be harmoniously building itself up. That's what Paul wanted them to do. Let's look at what these things wanted to do. Look at people partnerships. Now, 
These were written to real men, this letter was. This was a letter. It was written to real men because the Patrons had told Paul, as he was in prison, what was going on. And the people were struggling with their knowledge of Christ. They were struggling with how good Christ was. Was Christ enough? Because people were telling them, these false teachers, that, yeah, well, well, Christ is good, but you need this secret knowledge that I'm going to give you. Anybody comes to you and says secret knowledge? I have secret knowledge for you. I want, I want you to run faster than you sing both than the other. You sing both the other one. There's not secret knowledge. The Bible contains what we need to know and what Paul was saying that we need to know about our relationship with God. You don't need to supplement. You don't need something else. Because we do not grow. What we do need, though, the Bible says, is we need each other. We can't grow in isolation. We don't grow isolated from one another. The reason why we covenant together, churches covenant together, to work together, to commit together, is because we need each other to kind of shave off the edges of our lives. We need to grow. We need to practice things like forgiveness. We need to practice things like encouragement. We need to practice things like preaching. We need to practice things like prayer together. And so when people come to mind with Paul, he says they struggle. They were to hold one another up. Now, the only longer section of this greeting with people is found in Romans. Here, there are ten people Paul mentions. Look at them. There's Tychicus. There's Onesimus. In verse 10, you find Aristarchus. And you find Mark. Then you go down to verse 12, you find Epaphras. Verse 14, you find Luke. Then you find... Nymphia and Demas. Then you find Archippus. And finally you find Paul. Because of the so there are a lot of names. A lot of them are obscure. We don't know much about them. It's always fun <coughs> when the pastor has a passage and he's going through a book and there's not much and you kind of go, how, how do I order? How do I communicate this? Well, if we're going to be a people of holy harmony, we're going to be uh, committed to people partnerships. We're going to partner with people. We're going to work together with people because we have affection for each other. You see, look at what he says to Tychicus at the beginning. He says, Tychicus will tell you about all my activities. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant of the Lord. I think Paul is giving us three things, three full expressions of his admiration, of his affection. He said he was a beloved brother. So, so and he dealt with people, he, he wanted people to become beloved brothers. Beloved brothers in the, in the scripture are people that have worked alongside each other, that have come together to work together, that, that don't always yell at each other, and, and the, but they, they point out differences, they point out deficiencies, but they come together for the cause of the gospel and its growth, not only in their lives, but in the lives of the church and throughout the world. He says, you're my beloved brother. Something must have happened, you must have known them. I mean, I'm going to ask you, can you say that about people in your church? Yeah. Are we beloved brothers and sisters? Do we, do we come together on Sunday morning and realize that it's not just about us, it's about all of us. It's about each other. It's about people beyond this. Well, they're not four walls. They're six, seven, eight, whatever the walls are in here. <laughs> because we exist as part of a grand body, not only of Little River Baptist Church, but of churches across the world. And then he said, are you a faithful minister? See, Tychicus 
was serving. He just wasn't sitting in the pew. He just wasn't saying, okay, I, I like the feeling I get when I come to church, and so I go, I come to church, I do my thing, and I go home. He was serving with someone. He was a faithful, it says, minister. A faithful minister. So you're a faithful minister. See, minister isn't a title that is given to somebody. It is, it is what Christians are. It is because we endeavor to do the activity of ministry, we become ministers. All of you minister in different ways. Some of you may minister to me. I may minister to you. We all have gifts and we all minister in the body to one another. You see, the package according to Acts 20, verse 4, was from the area of Ephesus. And we think he may have witnessed the, the riot that the artisans revolted against the pre when the artisans revolted against the preaching of the gospel. You see, Paul had to make a quick exit out of the area, and to Titus accompanied Paul we believe. And towards the end of Paul's life, he sends back to Titus to Ephesus because he was concerned about what was going on there. See, the best thing in ministry is people. The most important thing in ministry is people. I said this before, the only thing we have here is wonderful. It's a great expression that gives us the ability to do ministry, but what it is is a rain pot. Because you are the church. You are the ministers. The building doesn't do anything except protect us from the rain, the snow. You know, I think you have snow here, right? How experienced did I know? Yeah, you're obviously okay. But people, holy harmony requires that we partner with people, that we have people partnerships. Paul knew that the Caicos was a faithful minister. He was also, he says, at the end of verse 7, a fellow servant. Or maybe some of you are saying a fellow bond servant in the Lord. He was close to Paul. There was an intimacy there. You know, Jesus had the 120. He had the 70 that he ministered to. He had the 12 disciples. He had the three closest disciples, and then he had his beloved disciple, the Apostle John. Let me tell you, you can't be close with 200 people all the time. That's why the church has to grow up numerically, it has to also grow slower in some ways in the way it groups itself. This week, we're, weekend, we're going to have a new vision for Sunday School Conference. One of the ways that we can build this type of fellow <coughs> servant or fellow bond servant ministry in our lives is that we have to have ministries available for people to work alongside each other. And one way we do that is in our Sunday school, or what we call Bible communities. They, they are ministries, and very important ministries to the life of this church. In fact, I believe if you take away the, the mid-sized kind of groups, the Bible fellowships, the Sunday schools, and you take away small groups, and you, all you have is a service, the church struggles with growing because it never can minister alongside each other. People tend to watch and listen, but not participate. You also have Onesimus. Onesimus was beloved. Now, you know, you know Onesimus, don't you? Great God. Actually, he ran away from his master. And in, in, in Rome, he became a Christian. And Paul says, listen, go back to your master and become one of them within the join the church that your master is at so that you can minister as an equal right alongside Philemon. That's why the book of Philemon was written. He was beloved. Aristarchus was my fellow prisoner. Talks about the word implies that Aristarchus was arrested with Paul. He joined himself to Paul. He was a prisoner of war with Paul. You remember Mark on the first missionary?
very true. What did Paul have a disagreement over Barnabas? Whether the Apostle Paul should come with them on the second trip. Because what did Paul Mark do? He deserted them on the first journey, and Paul was not about running camps. He was on a mission that he believed that people had to have a certain commitment. So he didn't want Mark along with him. John Mark could be, he could do his own thing. Paul didn't want anything to do with him. Barnabas took him. And so Barnabas and Paul went their own way. But you'll notice here that, that now Mark, it says, if you read down in verse 10, it says, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning him who you've received instruction, he comes to you, welcome. Paul had forgiven, I believe, Paul. Paul had forgiven Mark. And he had restored that relationship, and he realized Mark, while he was young, was struggling with things, and maybe he shouldn't have gone on with him like then and there, but he restored their fellowship to each other. People. People were important. You can go down and you can talk about justice, the, the worker for the kingdom of God, the Luke, the beloved physician. And he trusted these people. They were trusting. Paul could trust them. People ministry means that you have to give trust to people. Because let me tell you, I can't do it all. You can't do it all. We have to trust others. And we as a church need to cooperate with other churches because we can't do it all. The Kikos was an example, a wonderful example of this. You know, we have, no, we have nothing about him except that he delivered this information to Paul. You know, he wasn't part of the, the office of the church. He didn't do any preaching. Yet he was trusted for his faithfulness. Onesimus was trusted to carry uh, the epistle and deliver just the right information and communicate with the Colossians. Um, and there was communication. So Paul is about people. We read about Demas. We read about Nympia. I mean, they had a church in the area, and Paul thought, man, that is great because they're building up the body of Christ. They're, they're working alongside each other. People. Prayer power. Another thing that the church has to understand that ministry is about not only people, but prayer. Martin Luther said, pray. you know, Martin Luther prayed three hours every morning. So that's, that's the story I have. And at one time he told, one person says, you don't have time to pray, someone said. And he told the, his, his comrade, he says, if I don't pray, I don't accomplish it. See, a church needs to pray. Pray together. Paul was a praying man. And you look at Epaphras. Look down at verse 12 in Colossians 4. It says, Epaphras is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always, struggling on your behalf in his prayers. See, he prayed because he loved them. First of all, Epaphras, I think, was a people guy. He partnered with people, and because he did that, he prayed for them. He struggled. There was an intensity to his struggle. He agonized. How many of us agonize in prayer? Do we agonize over people that we pray for? Do we, he worked hard, in a sense. He worked hard, Epaphras did, struggling in prayer, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. It says in verse 13, for I bear witness that he has worked hard for you. And for all those who lay on the sea and for office, remember those are the three cities that form the, the, the economic and political climate of the day, right in the middle of the major minor there. So he was working hard. He was a man of prayer. He worked in prayer. The number of, the numbers were not just numbers on a roll, they were people. See, we, sometimes in the American church we're so concerned about numbers that we forget that numbers are people. People go through difficulties. They're, just, they're not widgets. They're, they're not things you just produce and have no feelings. People go through many difficulties in life and prayer is what Paul says to these people as he remembers them and they're committed to the body of holy harmony. Prayer is important. 
Let me ask you this question. Do you share the same burden as Paul? Do you share the same burden that Paul had for the body of Christ? To pray? If the church is simply a place and not a people, then I can, I can assure you, you don't have a burden to pray. But if, if the church, if you see the church as a people, you will have a, a burden to pray. Not only about us, but about people all around this world. It's about the relationship we have. And any desired brothers. So people, prayer, and proclamation. The final thing. See, the whole epistle of Colossians is about instruction. Carefully delivered to the church at Colossae. And one of the things he did was he, that they were encouraged to do in the church is, is to publicly read Scripture. See, he encouraged them to read. And it says in verse 16, Colossians 4, it says this, And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodicean. And see that you also read the letter from the from Laodicea. So he was encouraging to read, to read the word, to, to publicly read it together as he was addressing the whole group. Someone will ask me, why do we read the scriptures in our service? Why, why do I take the time to read scripture? We've gone through, if you haven't noticed, the book of John up to chapter 16. And I've just been reading portions of the book of John. And I've done it publicly because I believe that it is beneficial for you to hear the word of God read because it should endear your heart. That's why we read the scriptures. It's amazing that people who say they believe the Bible in their worship gatherings read so little of scripture. And people who are more liberal and say they don't really believe the Bible is all read it a lot more because they have this tradition. I want us to read the scripture. What if, what if we would read, say, a New Year's Eve, could we read the Gospels together? What, what if we read several epistles together? Could we read together the New Testament? I know that's a big chunk of scripture and it takes time. But there is nothing Paul encouraged Timothy. He says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture and to exhortation and to teaching. 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. You see, it all comes down to how he ministers. That's a long Scripture. They were passing the Scriptures back and forth. They were reading the, 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 the book or the letter that Paul had written to the Laodiceans. And some people believe that was the book of Ephesus that had been around, circulating around. But whatever book it was, they were to encourage each other by reading each other's letters that Paul was writing. You see, you see in ministry, ministry is about heart. Ministry is all about working together, being together, working out differences, moving forward, taking chances, Taking risks because we believe in the power of God to change people's lives. There is no other gospel than Jesus Christ who died for sinners and has risen again. There is no other gospel that will help you grow in your faith. See, the gospel is not just about getting your sins forgiven. The gospel is everything in this book because it's all good news. It's all good news. And so when I mention the gospel, I want it to be thick. Juicy like a stick. Not just a little bit of tin. People get their sins forgiven and then they, then they don't think about God for the next five years. No. God says, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy labor, and I will give you rest for your souls. But he also says, Follow me and take your cross. Take your cross and follow me. It's the same thing. We do that every single day. The day. As we conclude this book and the message of this book, remember, holy harmony is necessary for spiritual growth. 
for our scripture. Because Jesus plus nothing is everything. Heavenly Father, I can bow and ask you this morning that as we have come to this wonderful 